Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Thank you for joining me here today for the 110th episode of For the Love of History. It doesn't slide off the tongue very well, the 110th episode, but it is a really cool milestone, and I'm so happy that you're here to spend it with me. I really appreciate you tuning in every week and spending some time with me learning about cool history stuff. And before we dive into our topic, I just want to give you a quick housekeeping reminder. For the Love of History does have a YouTube channel now. And if you are watching this episode on YouTube, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you are not, go ahead, head down to the show notes click the little link and subscribe because it is one of the best free 99 ways to help for the love of history podcast because the more subscribers we get the closer we get to monetization and if we can monetize on youtube then we can make even more cooler amazing content so it's it's a win-win situation for everybody so i would really appreciate that thank you so much and with that bit of housekeeping out of the way, let's jump right into our topic. I get very interesting messages from the history parents, in particular history dad. You know him. (laughs) I've talked about him a lot on the podcast, but today's episode topic was given to me by history mom. She's been on the podcast a few times. She's an absolute gem. Hi, mom. I know you're listening to this episode. Love you so much. Thank you for sending this. So I included it in the topic polls for this season. And thankfully, you chose this topic. It all worked out very nicely. Today, we will be talking about the forgotten nurses of World War II, the cave girls of Okinawa. Today's topic is on the heavier side, dear one. So make sure you have a good warm blanket and a box of tissues by you just in case. And with that, Let's get to it. When we talk about Japan in World War II, the Battle of Okinawa often gets left out, and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki takes center stage in most World War II media and history content. But the Battle of Okinawa was Japan's last stand against the U.S., and the only place where battles happened on Japanese soil. If the Battle of Okinawa is mentioned at all, people usually start by talking about the kamikaze pilots who flew into U.S. battleships along the southern islands. And they also talk about the cave and tunnel warfare that the Japanese military established on the island in order to surprise the U.S. military. But today, we're not talking about the U.S. military We're not talking about the Japanese military, or at least that side of it. No, dear one, today we are talking about the young high school girls who were forced to become battlefield nurses. But before we do, let me explain a little bit about the Battle of Okinawa. This is very brief, so if you want a little bit more information, you can check the resources in the show notes for more information. As the war was coming to an end in Europe, the Japanese government was urging its citizens to continue the fight at all costs. The Japanese military and civilians began preparing for the final battle. The Japanese military dug miles and miles of underground tunnels using the natural caves of Okinawa to help them. In the end, over 66 miles or 106 kilometers were dug around the island. The idea was to use the element of surprise because they were extremely outnumbered and outgunned. And the Japanese military weren't the only ones preparing for the battle. Civilians were also forced slash voluntold slash willingly participated in becoming members of the military. Every single male aged 15 to 60 and every single female aged 17 to 40 were conscripted into military service, which ended up being about a quarter or more of Japanese of Japan's total population, which was about 18 to 20 million people. And when you have this many people, the reasons and feelings towards joining are going to be completely different. Some people did it because of 
propaganda. Some did, people did it because of brainwashing. Some people did it because they honestly thought that it was their duty to protect Japan and the emperor. Some people did it just because they wanted to protect their families. And others didn't want to be involved at all, but were forced to due to government and social pressures. And I cannot stress enough how much the Japanese government pushed for total participation of all citizens to protect Japan and how very big brothery the government became at this time. And I'm not saying that Japan was unique in this during this time. Absolutely not. So many governments were doing the same thing. I just think context is important to understand the mindset of what was going on at this time. The Japanese government had complete and total control over the entire country. The news, the media, the supply chain, and education. Schools became factories and training grounds, and everything that was done was done for the good of the Emperor Hirohito and for the country. The U.S. decided that in order to help end the war, the islands of Okinawa, which were strategically located, needed to be captured. So the U.S. decided to launch its official attack on April 1st, 1945, officially beginning the Battle of Okinawa. But when they landed on the beaches, they were completely empty. They met little to no resistance until they reached the hills in the inner part of the island. From the ground emerged the military and conscripted civilian soldiers. Over the next 82 days, over 12,000 U.S. soldiers lost their lives, as well as 110 thousand Japanese. It's impossible to know just how many civilian conscripts were killed in the battle, but some estimations go between 80 and 100,000. And among those countless dead were the young high school girls of the Shiraume Gakukai, the Okinawa cave nurses. Almost all schools in Japan during World War II were used in support of the war effort. Whether it was elementary school children who were taught to farm and produce food, or write comfort letters to soldiers, or replaced factory workers who had been conscripted into the military, or older children in the middle and high schools who were taught how to build planes, build bombs, sew uniforms, and become soldiers. Everyone was a part of the war effort. And I have this picture that you maybe you have seen in some of my other videos. You can't see it now because it's out of frame. But this is a postcard of high school girls learning how to fight with swords to defend themselves against U.S. military. It was a part of the school curriculum. Everything was focused on the war effort. The young girls of Okinawa Prefectural Second Girls High School were no different. The school was originally opened up in 1905 as an all-girls art school, and throughout the war, they tried to study hard and continue learning even when their school was bombed and they were forced into temporary buildings. But in February of 1945, the war finally caught up with them in Okinawa and they were forced into the war effort. The art school was turned into a makeshift nurse training facility where the girls between the age of 15 and 17 were trained. The plan was to have the fourth years trained for a few months and then set out, but as the Americans drew closer and the war intensified, the government disbanded the nursing school almost as soon as it started and they sent 46 girls to the 24th Division's First Field Hospital on Mount Yase. These girls were between the age of 15 and 17 and had only 18 days of nurse training. 18 days. When they were sent out, they were just told to do what they can and ask for help when they didn't know what to do. Which unfortunately was not unusual during this time. Many young girls became nurses all over Japan, but these girls, these children had no adult nurses, no teachers to guide them, no support system whatsoever other than each other. And what they faced over the next two months was an absolute hell. The Battle of Okinawa was the 
bloodiest battle fought on the Pacific Theater. The Pacific Theater means countries around the Pacific Ocean, including East Asia, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. As we talked about before, 110,000 soldiers and civilians died during this battle, and it was only 82 days long. And that many casualties happened. And the people that were there to take care of these soldiers were girls like the Shirahume, or the White Plums, as they were often called. They worked day in and day out, doing what they could with their only 18 days of training. Their makeshift hospital called Nunomachi Gama, Gama means cave in the Okinawan language, was 500 meters long and at one point had 1,000 soldiers at once seeking treatment from 46 girls and a handful of doctors. The treatment that these young girls provided included helping soldiers use the bathroom, picking out maggots from wounds with tweezers by lamplight, and holding down wounded soldiers so that their limbs could be amputated. All the while, bombs and bullets fell around them. And on top of everything else, as if that wasn't enough, they were also responsible for leaving the cave, getting food and water, bringing it back, and distributing the rations. On June 4th, after almost 70 days of non-stop hellish work, the 24th Division's First Field Hospital was forced to disband. This included the girls. And you'd think that the military would have help the girls, right? They were the ones that conscripted them in the first place. And surely after two months of actual hell on earth and sacrifice, you'd think that the adults in charge of this military unit would have seen these 46 children and help them escape, right? Oh my God, I'm sorry. There when I wish, I wish. I wish I could tell you that they did and the girls got out safely, but it pains me to tell you that not only did the military not help the Shiraume, they told the girls that it would be better to unalive themselves instead of letting the U.S. military catch them. And on that day when the cave hospital disbanded, Five hundred soldiers were unable to leave the cave and instead were given poison, knives, and grenades to end their lives. Some of the girls, rather than face what was outside of the cave walls, chose to end their lives there as well. And one of the survivors, Kiku Nakayama, recalls in an interview, quote, In this bunker, six of my classmates killed themselves by drinking poison. And nearby, while escaping, four were killed by flamethrowers and other U.S. weapons. The remaining girls who escaped the cave fled to Kuniyoshi, where they selflessly continued to help the wounded where they could. But from June 21st to the 22nd, the U.S. ramped up its final attack to end the Battle of Okinawa. And of the 46 girls who entered the Shiraume Gakutai, 22 were killed in those final two days. And when Okinawa was finally taken over by the U.S., the girls were left to fend for themselves. The Japanese military refused to claim them or acknowledge that they existed. And to the U.S. military, they were just like any other conscripted civilians, left to pick up the pieces of their lives. girls of the Shiraume are not the only ones to have suffered and died in the Battle of Okinawa. 500 other teachers and students from the Himeyuri Corps were also conscripted into the service of the war. And over half of the Himeyuri Corps, along with their teachers, were among the 110,000 casualties of the Battle of Okinawa. And for those that survived, the nightmare wouldn't end until many years later. 
Japan was devastated. There was hardly any food or water or resources left in Japan and even less in Okinawa. And while the girls of the Himeyuri Corps were somewhat taken care of after the war, the 24 remaining girls of the Shiroume were not. Their efforts and sacrifices in the war were not commemorated by the Japanese government, and a local group of survivors and their families were the ones to pull together enough money to build a small memorial for their fallen sisters. And although the history textbooks may have forgotten these young girls, people of Okinawa, dear one, most certainly have not. In the 1980s, a peace museum was created to memorialize and give the surviving Okinawa cave nurses a place to share their stories. Up until this year in January, when the last nurse, Kiku Nakayama, passed away, a nurse was at the museum almost every single week telling their story. And I'd like to end our episode today talking about Kiku Nakayama, for she did not go quietly into that good night. Nay, nay, dear one. She told her story. She not only talked about her experiences in the museum, she also led tours, she spoke at conferences, she wrote a freaking book, which we'll talk about in a second, and she also would go down into the gamas, into the caves, and help retrieve the remains of the soldiers and the nurses. She was an absolute powerhouse and worked and worked to tell the story and make sure that these girls would not be forgotten. The book that she wrote called Kiku-san no Okinawa-sen or Kiku's Battle of Okinawa was published independently when she was in her 80s proving that you are never too old to do something that you want to do. Right now it's only in Japanese, but it is in the process of getting translated into English, and when that happens, I will be sure to tell you about it. Even though it was extremely difficult for her to talk about, Kiku never shied away from an opportunity to talk about what happened to her. And she always said, quote, it's my mission to keep sharing my experiences with others as long as my health allows. And now you and I carry a small part of their experience, dear one, and we will keep their stories alive. Well, my dish, I can't even, that was a, that was a heavy episode. I hope you're doing okay after that. And I, I don't ever want to leave you feeling hopeless and I I have a bit of hope for you if not hope a little bit of happiness I guess with my final thought today a little bit of information to to keep you going because there is this enduring message of hope and peace that all of these women who told their story at the museum they always had hope and I want to share that hope with you so Through the efforts of the people of Okinawa and relatives of the survivors, along with many other people who are passionate about keeping the memory of the Shiraume alive, a film was made in 2022 that is part interview and part reenactment of the Battle of Okinawa from the perspective of the Shiraume nurses. It's an incredible film, and unfortunately, the entire thing hasn't been translated into English yet, but the interview sections have, and I will link them in the show notes below. The film is called Otome Tachi no Okinawa Sen, Shiraume Gakuto no Kiroku, which means Battle of Okinawa for Young Girls, Records of the Shiraume Student Corps. Their story is by no means lost, dear one, and through the efforts of so many, including you now, their stories will eventually get the attention they deserve. And one final thing, I just want to point out how lucky we are and how important it is to share history from different perspectives. It's the whole reason that I do this, and it's the whole reason representation and diversity in history education is so important. So I encourage you to remember that you are a part of history and your perspective is unique and important. Never forget that, dear one. Never, ever forget that.
Well, dear one, that is all for today. It was very heavy. I hope that you're doing okay. And today, more than any other episode days, please make sure that you do something to make you happy. Go outside, hug an animal, smell some flowers, say nice things to yourself, drink your water, please. And thank you very much. I'm going to take this little sippy sip right now. Mm. Okay. Did you take a, a drink? Please tell me that you did. And to end out our episode today, if you did get something out of today's episode, please share it with your friend. Leave a rating or a review review so more people can learn about these brave young girls. It really, really does help. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can join me over on Patreon. Support from patrons like Emily, Shayna, and April allow me to not only keep up this podcast, but make it better and better each episode. So one more time, take very good care of yourself, drink your water, and I will see you next week for a much lighter and long awaited Empress Batty episode. So I will see you later. Love you. Bye. Say bye, Ted. Bye. (laughs) Why is there a metronome right now? Okay. (laughs) 